Okay, welcome to tonight's webinar in association with Revlog Coaching, the underage section of Cork GA. Tonight's webinar will be available to watch back on YouTube and podcasts from tomorrow morning on the revlog.com uh, website. I'm delighted to welcome St Dr. Stephen Bean on to join us tonight. Stephen has recently finished his doctorate in the area of physical literacy in children in DCU. Uh, Stephen has a vast experience in the GA as a full-time GPO in Dublin, most recently with Clantarf GA who have some fantastic resources available on their GA website, which Steve would have been a part of putting together. Um, and other than that, I just want to say thanks very much for joining us, Stephen. And I know you've got a few slides and stuff, but you might just give a quick background on, I suppose, where, what brought you to this, this level of stuff. Yeah, Colin, thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, so I was a GPO uh, in Dublin uh, for nearly 10 years, uh, where I first met Colin. Um, and from on, on the back of doing some uh, a thesis as part of my master's through it, uh, I stumbled across fundamental movement skills and, and sort of started looking, exploring the importance of them. And then saw that they were, they were part of a much wider sort of a field. And uh, that's what brought me down the route of, of looking at physical literacy and trying to explore, um, one, how, how we can motivate kids to be more active. I suppose from my point of view, I was going into schools and fourth, fifth, sixth class kids, boys or girls, zero interest, not just in GAA, but actually in any PE or physical activity at all. So I found that that was, uh, it didn't sit well with me. So I wanted to try and figure out how I could uh, maybe try and change that. And here I am. Um, so um, that's basically it. So I'll, I'll jump straight in. Um, so just in terms of what physical literacy is, we're going to talk about how we as coaches can help provide a platform to be active for life, as well as and um, that's like the big picture stuff, but it's also hugely important in terms of developing people that their skills, develop them as an athlete. So um, if, if we are just looking at it through a GEA lens that we want them to be the best Camogie player, hurler, uh, footballer that they can be. Uh, and that starts very early on in life. So um, in terms of physical literacy, it's starting to get loads of traction now. It's the buzzword at the moment. Uh, fundamental movement skills um, is still massively important, but they were probably the buzzword a few years ago. Um, but in terms of our national sports policy, first one we've ever had, 10-year strategy, you can see physical literacy in, is in action one, in action two around our schools, action three around our sporting, our NGBs, and in action four uh, around the Department of Children and Youth, okay? So it's everywhere, okay? Um, and I suppose what really, really is the key to this and the key to understanding this is that Ireland is due to be the most obese nation in Europe by 20. Uh, by 2030 okay and that's from the world health organization so this is the key to why i i suppose really started looking into it when we when we discovered uh, how bad the situation was is how can we get kids to want to be active i myself i like for me as a kid I, I was always out i was out um football hurling climbing trees whatever it may be and i couldn't understand still can't why some kids actually don't uh, want to be to do the same thing so we know one in four children is overweight or obese in Ireland. Um, and recent studies uh, have shown that just 17% of primary school children meet the national physical activity guidelines. That's 17%, okay? And if we look even closer at that, the 13% girls are the only that make it and 23% boys, okay? The guidelines are 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Moderate is just above, uh, a, a brisk walk is moderate. So it's not hard to get. But what's really worrying is that this study uh, from 2019 uh, is a follow-up study from 2009, so 10 years later, and we've actually dropped. So all the investment, all the, the initiatives to get kids more active were gone from 19% to 17% in the primary school of children. So that's quite worrying. And we know that their increased screen time, they're like three hours a day on average, looking at a screen of some sort. And we, um, and we might seem like the obvious solution is Let's just get them more physically active. But there's been loads of initiatives to promote physical activity, but they're not, they, they don't seem to be working. So we started looking at a different approach. So what we, we looked at all the research and what enables children to be physically active. That's what we started, what we really focused in on. How can kids be physically active? What do they need present in their lives? What do they need in terms of their environment or the support network? And how can we impact that then as practitioners, as, so that's as coaches, as teachers, or whatever it may be. So we're talking about physical literacy. There's three main components to this. We've got one is the motivation and confidence. So are you motivated to go out and play? 
as simple as that. Something as simple as that. There's loads of facets of it, but just let's go with that one. Are you motivated to go out and play? Are you confident to go out and play and maybe try new things, try some new physical activity things, whether that be in a different sport, in a dance and gymnastics, climbing a tree, anything at all. Are you confident to try? Are you motivated to go out and actually be active to play? Then there's the knowledge and understanding bit, okay? So do you understand why physical activity is so good for you? Do you understand, um, for instance, that um, running or good cardio is good for your heart, okay? It increases your cardiovascular health, okay? So do you know the different types of physical activity? And you can see now that the motivation and confidence and knowledge and understanding, they start to merge together here, okay? So that now if we know that running is good for our heart and we understand that a good heart means a, a healthy heart, we may be more motivated to go out and run, okay? And then the last component then we're looking at is physical competence. So you do you have the underlying physical skills to take part in the activity that you're being asked to take part in, okay? So if you can run properly um, and uh, you know you can run, you're confident in it, you'll be more motivated to run, which will mean then uh, you might, you'll get even better at running. Okay, and these all merge together to form uh, uh, to provide opportunities to, for your physical activity. So that's what we mean by physical literacy. That all of those merging together, how they interact with each other, provides the opportunity and outlet to be physically active. Okay, slightly less complex in in terms of here. And um, so we're talking about physical literacy is the physical confidence, confidence, motivation, knowledge, and valuing to be active for life. That's the key thing here to be active for life. But let's just break that right down. So we talk about physical competence. So let's just break it down into a kick, okay? If I know I can kick a ball, if I'm able to kick a ball, if I've been taught or if I've uh, learned myself or, or through with any means uh, that we've learned, I'll be confident to do it. If I'm confident to do it, uh, that means I'll be maybe confident to do it with my family, with my friends or, or whatever uh, environment that I'm in. If I'm confident to do it, I'll then be more motivated to do it. So that will drive our motivation. And if I'm more motivated to do it out on the road or in school or down the GA club, that means I'm going to do it more often, which increases that physical competence, okay? So these things, they drive each other all the way. And you can see that the knowledge and the value comes in as we progress through. Um, but the, the really one I want to focus on at the minute is that basic, basic, uh, that these basic components of physical competence, confidence and motivation. So what can happen is a negative spiral of disengagement can begin at a really early age, right? So let me explain that. That's really, really simple. Go back to this for a second. If I'm bad at kicking, okay, my physical confidence, if I'm bad at kicking, I'm going to be less confident to do it uh, in front of everyone else, which means I'll be less motivated to do it uh, in any environment, which means I won't practice as much, which means I won't get any better at it. Okay, so that's what we mean by a negative spiral. So think about this. If I am in first class in school and teacher throws the ball in for a game of football between the whole class, Colm over there is a, a silky um, football player and he gets the ball, dribbles through three or four people, passes to me. Okay, the ball hits off my foot and goes off to the opposition. The opposition get the ball, score a goal. So a few things are going to happen. One, Colm's not going to pass to me anymore. Okay, now whether Colin would have passed me in the first place or not is, is, is up for debate. Uh, but two, I'm going to feel bad that I'm not as good as Colin. Secondly, uh, other people are going to notice that I'm not as good as Colin. Okay, that happens once, not, so, not that big of a deal. Okay, happens three or four weeks in a row, all of a sudden I don't really like football. Goes on for a few years, oh, I don't like PE, all of a sudden you're in your teens and uh, you, you don't want to be physically active because of that negative spiral of disengagement. On the plus side though, that we can create a positive spiral of engagement at a very early age, and we're gonna talk through how. So remember, our physical competence drives our confidence, which then drives our motivation and that knowledge to, to value the physical activity, and that cycle starts again. So that's what we call a positive spiral of engagement. So physical competence. So we talk this, about this an awful lot, and you've all heard about fundamental movement skills. So these are the foundational movements needed to progress to the more specialized and complex skills used in play game, to play games and specific sports. So if I'm able to kick the ball on the ground, and I'm able to run, and I'm able to catch, okay? If I'm able to do those in isolation first, and then uh, to get confident in them and practice more often, the motivation will drive me to get better, 
all of a sudden then I'm going to be able to link those together and take part in soccer, Gaelic football, basketball potentially there as well. Okay, so there's a very, very quick example. So these are the things that we need to bear in mind when we're start, particularly when we're starting out coaching at a nursery or a young age level, uh, CCC1. They're made up of, there's about 20 of them different skills, but the basics are running, jumping, skipping, throwing. Um, we call the locomotor skills, we call moving your body. Um, object control, we call uh, manipulating an object. So kicking, throwing, uh, catching, striking. And the locomotor will be running, skipping, jumping, etc. And then we've got balance skills. So that's basically uh, your balance. And that, that's various different forms. So one-legged balance, two-legged balance, etc. So these are really, really important. And you've all heard of them before. Okay. But the big thing is here. So forget about the motivation, confidence bit that we talked about already for now. But just focusing in on those fundamental movement skills. Okay. Kids who demonstrate better proficiency at those FMS at a young age, so at a, between the ages of five and seven, the kids who score better in those basic, basic skills are much more active as teenagers. Okay, so that's been proven. They've tracked kids over time and they've shown that those kids are way more active as teenagers. Okay, so right from the offset, if we can get those basic skills in kids in our nurseries and school or whatever it may be, if we can get them more proficient that's already having a huge knock-on impact 10 or 12 years into later on into the life. That's huge as a coach. That's huge. It's that might be delayed gratification, but that's absolutely huge for that child. Okay. And um, what we did was we basically went out and we tested all over the country. Okay. We tested over 2000 kids, uh, 12 different counties, four provinces, 44 schools, uh, and traveled right uh, around the country and the projects in conjunction with, with the GAA. But what we found, that we have really, really low levels of uh, FMS master, skills mastery, okay? So here's all your skills are down on the left-hand side that we tested, okay? So run, catch uh, up the top, and then gallop and overhand throw down at the bottom, okay? So what, what I mean by mastery or near mastery, mastery means you've nailed it. You can do the skill every single time, not a bother. Near mastery means that you've just about got it. You get it most of the time, but not quite. So we're not worried about the kids who have mastery or near mastery they're going to be fine okay so you're looking at the results and you might be thinking well 75 percent for a run uh that, that's pretty good okay that means though that 25 percent can't run properly okay think about the amount of activities or the amount of sports that that precludes them from okay or, or that they may feel uh, a lack of confidence or motivation to take part in so these things are really important in that sense and then you go down to overhand throw and only 16% have mastered it, okay? Can't stress enough how simple these skills are. We use a really, really simple uh, measure to, to, to uh, a really simple metric to measure these. And you might think overhand throw 16%, but yeah, but what's the big deal? How does that transfer into our sports? So I'll just give you an example of that. Uh, some of the criteria for an overhand throw is to be able to reach back behind your shoulder. So really simple, being able to reach back behind your shoulder with the ball, okay? Stepping with the opposite foot to hand, is, a re, is the next criteria for that, all right? So there, all of a sudden, you're showing some uh, bilateral coordination, okay? Uh, then the next criteria for that is to be able to uh, rotate the body and throw and follow through, okay? So there, you're, you're showing that you can produce power by combining forces from the lower body and the upper body, okay? Think of our uh, strike and hurling, okay? We twist our torso, we, use, we, we transfer force from the ground into our torso, to strike the ball a little bit further. So the same uh, systems and mechanics are working uh, just in a different way. So the wider the range we have of, uh, of mastery of these basic skills, the better. And that's why you hear so many coaches at the, t at the elite level or so many top level athletes talk about their multi-sport background, okay? The Tiger Woods and the Andre Agassiz that didn't do anything else, they're the exception to the rule. All the other top guys, multi-sport background even if, if any of you might have seen the last dance michael jordan played fo american football baseball um he played several different sports in, in high school before specializing in basketball and um, on the other side of it then we looked at we know that self-efficacy or confidence that that drives physical activity okay so that's well established all right and um, so we looked at then how does the fms how do the fundamental movement skills affect that confidence and what we found was that their perception of themselves uh, was a bigger driver to, towards physical activity than their actual confidence. 
So you ask a five-year-old, can you run really fast? He's going to tell you, absolutely. Uh, I'm like you saying, Bald, I'm really, really fast. Watch me, watch me, watch me. Bang. Off they go. So their perception of their skill is a lot higher than it act their actual skill competence is. Okay? Bear with me now here. Okay, so you think about that for a five-year-old. That's brilliant. We, what we want to do is, and we, sorry, we know that that perception, a higher perception of ourselves, drives us to be more confident, especially towards physical activity. Okay, and we already know if we drive our confidence, that will drive our motivation and we get, and then that will drive our actual confidence, which means we get better and we get that positive spiral that we talked about. So imagine that the five-year-olds have that higher perception of themselves all the time. Okay, they think they are here, whereas in reality, they're way lower than that. All right, as we get older, we see that that perception of themselves levels off with their actual competence. Okay. And then as we get older again, their perception of them, their, 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 their actual scalability and that competence is actually lower than their actual competence. So it's really, really important that we, if we can get in there early and keep that per perception of themselves high, we can have a lasting effect on them being active for life. What, okay? what, age, what age group, Stephen, would, would uh, I suppose, the perception, the positive perception start going towards, say, um, moving towards the negative side. What, what age groups would you generally find with that? Yeah, really good question. So we haven't published the results yet, but we're working on those. Um, around about the nine years of age, it, okay. it's a little bit different for the boys and the girls, um, but around about nine. So we're finding that as they get to sort of third class, that um, that perception and act, their perception of themselves is getting to be fairly accurate. And then after that, it's starting to, you're getting to the, see the disparity, okay? Would, and would, it, sorry, would that be linked in, like, to, I'm just trying to think purely from a GA perspective now, that if, let's say, you're in a club with two teams or three teams, um, would that have an input into it, or would that show up in your research, or is that even looked at in your research? We haven't... Uh, like, if, no, if, a player, if a player is on, let's say, the, the B team or the C team... Yeah, no, that's um, a really good question. Really would, that good question. Be, would that be kind of a, one of the reasons why it might be changing? Um, or uh, is it... Is it? I know that just got... I presume it's the same with every sport, that if a coach if a coach is picking a strong team and a weak team, do the kids yeah, start? Yeah, 100%. So, so uh, yes and no. And I suppose the, my answer to that is it depends. So... Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, if someone is on a, a, a B or a C squad or whatever you want to call it and feels that they're not as good as those on the A squad or, or feels inferior to, to, to others, that could absolutely impact their participation in that, in that game or in that sport. Okay? But on the other side, you look at coaches who have got three, uh, three or four teams at the under 15 or under 16 grade and they have A, B or C and D teams or whatever you want to call them and you see that it is certainly possible if done in the right way to keep those kids engaged to keep them improving and to keep them involved in that sport so does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah and we'll come back to that at the very yeah. end we'll No problem at all um, So again, back into our physical literacy that this cycle that drives us so our confidence driving our confidence and motivation okay um, so how do we improve these skills? And I'm only another couple of minutes and then, and then I'll open it up for questions, okay? So how do we improve these? And so we want to improve these basic movement skills that we talk about, okay? So these fundamental movement skills. Uh, and what we also want to do it while improving their motivation and confidence, okay? So the good news is the majority of you probably do it already. You just don't realize it, okay? So we know back in the old days, uh, kids have to be dragged in off the street. They'd be out playing on the road all the time. That uh, picture on the right is actually a picture from Colm's childhood, I think, uh, back in the day. Um, but nowadays, it's, it's very, very different. And kids have to be pulled out of the house. And even when they are out of the house, they are stuck uh, to a screen. Okay? So these things, uh, times have changed. And we're not getting the same exposure to free play, to playing with all the kids on your street or in the locality. So you might be playing, you can see in that picture there, some of them kids are probably only five or six, some are 10 or 11, 12. And that sort of peer-to-peer -peer interaction in a socially diverse way allows you to learn by mimicking, by, uh, by being taught through your peers, etc. That's not happening as much anymore, okay? So how can we actually impact that? So think about it. We don't teach children to read by giving them a book. Okay, first we teach the alphabet. 
okay we teach the letters the sounds of the letters how they form words then we form how to form sentences and then on from that how to form paragraphs etc etc until eventually the child is able to read the book and we do that through helping them to get there as best we can uh, and what we call it in coaching is a scaffolding approach okay loads of research out there if anyone's interested okay but basically it's really really simple if you know your players okay so if you can see my cursor here let's say this is level seven here okay where my cursor is we want to help them to level eight and then we want to help them on to level nine and level 10 and so on but if we go from level seven here and we try to get to level 12 in one jump they, they may not be successful it might be that little step too far okay so we need to be careful and we need to go one step at a time and provide that scaffolding there that they have that they can progress and even if they do get to level eight okay and then they fail getting to level nine but that's okay because they know they're here and they know they'll get there and if you give them that pathway of learning what you're doing is one you're developing their skills two you're developing their confidence uh, because they know they don't have far to fall if they fail but what you're also doing is you're providing an environment where they are learning all the time and they are learning how to learn and they're realizing that they are progressing and progressing at a steady rate and that everything is achievable. Okay. Um, Nintendo were the masters at it. Anyone who had uh, or, or has computer games, you see the kids are stuck into um, the Minecraft or um I can't remember the name of the other one now. It'll come to me. Um, but th that's because it's, it, they have mastered this scaffolding approach. It's little by little by little. Level one, you go. Uh, if you're Super Mario, you run around for a while. You, you, next thing, you get to level two. You die then straight away. But it's okay because you start again from level two. Eventually, you keep on going and going and going until you've mastered the game. But it's progressive all the time. And they, they're basically providing that small little challenge each time to help you get there and um, what they, they this has gone way back into social development theory from the, the 70s and what it means really simply what a child can do with assistance today he or she will be able to do by himself or herself tomorrow okay so think about the kids that you coach at the moment they're in this purple zone here okay that's their current understanding or where they are that's the, they can work there on assisted now if we ask them to do, we'll use the kick again for an example, right? So let's say they're, um, we'll use Colm as an example. Let's say Colm is able to kick at the moment uh, off, off the ground with his right foot and his left foot, okay? Now, if we asked him to kick out of his hands from his right foot and his left foot straight away without helping him at all, without any scaffolding, that may be out of reach for Colm. And you guys know your players better than I do. So that, that's where that comes in about knowing your players, okay? But if we go to that middle, that middle zone, that zone of proximal development, and we help Colm first kick with his strong foot out of his hands, okay? Here you go, Colm. Here's a little tip I have. Hold the ball in two hands, step forward, drop, and kick. Something small, something simple, and let him provide him the opportunity to practice and develop that, okay? All of a sudden, that's something that he can potentially achieve okay once he can master that all of a sudden then we go back to that purple zone so his now current understanding or his, his work where he can work on assisted is being able to kick with a strong foot uh, out of uh, his hands and also still being able to kick off the ground with both feet so the next step then will be to move on to the other foot okay and i hope that makes sense really simply that this is the zone of proximal development is our magic spot that's what the learner can achieve with an assist with assistance from you as a coach so if we tried something that was really really difficult uh, the anxiety may get too high okay so too too high for that that person there so they've low relatively low confidence and high anxiety so they're up here somewhere that they can't get there yet it's, too, it's a bridge too far too many scaffolds uh, levels scaffolding levels that we talk about over here on the opposite hand these guys could be really really good and the challenge is too low then okay too low of a challenge they get bored because they can already do it they know they can do it okay and that could be arrive in disruptive type of a, a scenario okay what we want to get them is in this sweet spot here this zone of proximal development okay and that's what you as a coach can do to help them get there 
Okay, everybody's not the same though. Okay, you've probably all seen this graphic before. It's not fair to ask all of them to climb that tree as a scenario. Okay, we can't do that. All right. And um, so what we use is a thing called differentiated instruction. Again, fancy word. You guys all do this anyway. Okay. Very simply, it means tailoring your instruction to meet individual needs. Okay. So this is from educational uh, research pedagogy. And um, so all that is is you know the kids you know what they're good at, you know what their strengths and weaknesses are. So from that, you develop a session that they can progress along, uh, along their own developmental pathway. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's what's required. And if we do that, we can really, really help uh, those kids uh, develop their skills in terms of for football and hurling or camogie, but also to become active for life, okay? And, and that's big picture stuff, that health, etc. as we go about it. Now, how we do about we need to be a little bit careful when i started out as a gpo i wanted all my cones in the absolute perfect way situated color coded and if one of them was moved i'd be stressed out but we need to be really really careful that uh because we can't accomplish everything we want to accomplish necessarily that way everybody's different but for me and um, we need to have that little bit of chaos and that little bit of uh, madness sometimes for kids to develop as best they possibly can okay so while from the stakeholder, from our point of view, it might look really, really good, and you might be thinking that it's fantastic. And um, from the stakeholder, we have to always bear in mind the stakeholder's point of view. And you can see there that all they, well, we think it looks great. All they see is a bunch of arseholes looking up. Okay, so um, we know active kids do better in life. All the research says us. It's a nice graphic there to show um, that they're less likely to be obese, less likely to smoke or drug use more likely to go to college to earn more to be more productive reduced uh, risk of heart disease and all those sort of um the diseases that can potentially impact their uh, length of their life and and then we also know that they're more likely then to be active parents and that cycle starts again so you are doing a huge amount more by focusing on these things at an early age you're doing a huge amount more than just teaching them how to solo or how to strike a ball you are teaching them how to be active for life. So never ever undersell yourselves on that front. Um, and, and if you think about it on a global scale, this is the UN, the United Nations, this is their sustainable goals from developed countries for the next 10 years or so. And you can see poverty and hunger are their first two targets. And then after that, good health and well-being. Okay. And what you're doing is a huge, huge impact on kids, good health and well-being. And lastly, if we want to look at it from a purely uh, GAA perspective, Okay, the kids who scored the highest in all these basic movement skills were also the that they were the kids who had the highest GEA uh, skill specific uh, scores as well. They were the kids who were the fittest, the most flexible, the strongest. Okay, so there is that correlation that the higher the FMS mass, those fundamental, those basic movement skills mastery at a young age, those guys are, are fitter, they're better athletes, and they, they it transfers better into linking the GEA skills together than after that. Um, so. In conclusion, uh, fundamental movement skills is not physical literacy, but that's okay. Uh, we know the fundamental movement skills. We, we know we can impact them early in life, okay? So we know we can do this in a relatively short period of time. The intervention that we would have ran ourselves in schools was over eight weeks, and we got a 25% bump in just one hour a week, okay? So uh, if we can increase kids' movement skills, particularly at the early age, you know, it's never too late, but particularly at an early age, we can uh, set them on a path to be active for life. And we can, uh, if we bear in mind then that increasing that confidence and that motivation along the way while we're coaching, we can have an absolutely huge impact on um, uh, them being active for life, but also in terms of the, their engagement, their participation, get at games, whether that be hurling football or camogie. Uh, I think that I've rambled on for long enough. Colm, I'm happy to answer any questions that may be. Do you want me to stop sharing, Colm, or how does this work? Yeah, go on, stop sharing there. Um, one second here now, and I'll just bring you again. Okay. Okay. So thanks, thanks for that, Stephen. Um, very, very interesting. A lot of interesting points there. So, uh, folks, if you have any questions, you can throw them into the chat. Um, just the first one I know is from Pat. Is the three things on this topic: parents, teachers, and coaches. Um, parents need to be better educated. Uh, more done in schools and coaches better educated years ago. More done in schools than now. Um, so, like I know, I know it's always. I suppose it's an easy thing, and we we've probably done it for years in our role, Stephen. That we, we kind of. Be, we'd kind of be looking for the teachers to do more um, without being conscious of their own 
they run like the, how much is it an hour P in a week? Yeah, like um, teachers get a bad rap, I think, on this sort of stuff. Um, uh, the majority of teachers I've met, and we, we've been all around the country and I've been working, are brilliant. They really, really have the best interests of their kids at heart. Um, there's a couple of caveats in there. They have 12, I think, curriculum subjects in the primary school year. Uh, the primary school year. They have a 27 and a half hour a week. Uh, take away an hour of that a day for breaks. Um, uh, that's a very, very short window to be covering 12 curriculum subjects in, in the class of young boys or girls. Um, so, and they only do have an hour a week for PE, uh, in theory. Okay, so um, I think a lot of them are doing their best. There definitely, there certainly is a, a, a striving uh, or a push and, or a want to get better in this sort of stuff. The PDSD uh, do some fantastic work in this. Um, to be fair to the GAA officers all around the country going into the schools, th like they're absolutely superb at this stuff. They are absolutely brilliant. I 100% agree that more education needs to be out there for parents and to get the word out. But I think um, that we can do that as coaches as well, that we can talk to the parents and say, look guys, this is why we're doing these type of skills in the nursery, or this is why we're working on these basic movements at under eight or under nine or whatever it may be. And this is why it's so important, not just to the sport that we're playing right now or, or today, but to be to have your child, to, for them to be active for life and for them to be uh, healthier for life. Because at the end of the day, if we can keep them active and they're, uh, sorry, the, the health obviously is, is, is paramount importance, but if we can keep them active and engaged and participating in sport in the teenage years, well, if we're the, pers the, the people who have provided that positive experience to them for five or six years previous, the odds are that they're going to stay playing football, hurling, camogie, or whatever it may be. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose like within the P curriculum, there is there six there are six different strands, and what they're allowed to do is it's swimming. Swimming is one of them. Um, dance is one of them. I think so. It's 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 very easy. For, for oh, I suppose external people to, to be critical, but it is they are fairly hands tied on a lot of things. Um, and the other thing as well, sorry, and lastly on teachers is that a lot of teachers, some teachers might not have happy confidence. It goes back to actually the confidence and motivation you're talking about. If they're not confident um, actually coaching and teaching kids in PE, they might be better, let's say someone might be better music or art, then they're more likely to do more of that with kids. But anyway, um, Questions, just going back on the conference motivation. So I know we spoke about A's and B's, and I suppose, look, we're, I'm probably asking for you more for your, uh, with your G, G, GPO hat on as well here. Um, like streaming of teams, it's something that gets asked on every, every single course we do. The last two nights we've done a foundation course and it's been brought up. Um, like, how does that, I suppose, inter or how does that, like we, we spoke briefly about it, but like, when should we start streaming teams? Like uh, I know some coaches, some coaches would say we shouldn't stream them until we should never have to stream them. Others would say we need them at seven. Um, there's benefits, put the five best players on one pitch against the opposition five best players and the weaker players on another pitch, they'll get more ball contacts and stuff like that. I suppose there's pros and cons, but well, from your experience, would you have any? Yeah, it's, oh, it's a tough question. Um, yeah. I, the answer, I suppose the answer is it depends. And I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a straight answer here, but let me give some context, right? Um, if streaming, if you, I don't see any reason why if you are doing it right and doing it, um, coaching your team right with, with, no, with, with not, a huge, not, a, not a major focus on winning uh, in kids. So, so, sorry, very little focus on winning, but focusing on development and progression. And if you're doing it right, and you're coaching kids, right? And every kid is getting the same opportunity uh, and the same quality of coaching. I don't think that streaming is necessarily going to um, to be damaging to any kids. Okay. But at the, on the other side of that coin is if uh, we're not doing that right, if we are conscious that let's say um, that that the, the the A team you mentioned earlier on, if they get maybe more preferential treatment or are seen to be um, perceived higher by, by parents or coaches, I think that can be damaging, okay? And again, it, but like I look at, um, if you're, anyone's ever had the, I, the chance to, to see uh, Chris van der Hagen speaking, um, he's from the Belgian FA in soccer. So in two year 2000, they were like 60 or 70th in the world in soccer and they were, they were at a loss. They were like, look, we need, to, we need to have a rethink of how we do things. So they basically tore up 
their whole model of soccer in the country. Okay, and what they did was they put a, a new system in place, and like they they play two aside up until under six or to under seven, I think it is, and then it goes into uh, three aside and then five aside, and they have every they play four quarters up until the age of under fifteen, and they have every every sub must start uh, at least two quarters. Okay, so they have all these different things about get, maximizing their participation and engagement for as long as they possibly can. And there's zero lack on that competitiveness uh, until I think it's seven, under 78. All right. Now, they've gone from uh, under, they've gone from 67th or 70th or whatever it was in the world to world number one in 2018 or 19 or, or whatever it was. Okay, so having that approach, I think where people, maybe get really really focused on streaming is just because you don't stream doesn't mean it's not going to transfer into elite performance in 10 or 15 years time okay so tr streaming your under 10 team it does not mean that those kids uh, are going to be elite at minor or at senior level okay at, at, with the set like the belgian the soccer have shown that with a huge emphasis on uh, a lack of competitiveness etc that they've they can show and they can produce elite footballers and they can produce them in a cohesive way that can they can perform at the top level. So again, I think it depends on how we do it and how we coach. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you. I go back and forth on this myself all the time. Um, but what I would say is if we are providing kids with opportunity to engage in physical activity through any sport whatsoever, it's an obligation on us to to be to be conscious of developing and progressing their skill levels, but also fostering that, that confidence and motivation that helps them to uh, progress, not just in that sport, but, uh, but in life as well. Man, that's a much better answer than I've ever given for that question. Um, I suppose I suppose a large part of it, Stephen, like, is the communication. If you're if you're a mentor and you're able to communicate with the parents that this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, that should, should ease a lot of problems in that regard. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm yeah, sure if, you ever, if you ever hear um, Paul Kilgannon talk, he talks about having met, uh, parent meetings a couple of times of the year. Here's what we're trying to do this year. Here's how we're going to try and do it. Anyone, any questions, and sets out the stall from the start so that everyone's on the same page, stuff like that. You know, so I think they are simple things and easy things that we can do to to uh, to work on that education piece and that communication. Excellent. Um, we got one from Donald here. Have you any suggestions, techniques on how to run a differentiated session where you were dealing with different abil abilities? So where we got the, the elite kid and the child who might might only be a beginner. Um, yeah. How do you how do you cater for them within a, within yeah. the, one session? Yeah, the tough, the, probably the toughest part about coaching kids, particularly if you have a big group. Um, and I, I feel for teachers, I teach. I don't know how the teachers do it in, in such an array of subjects. Uh, to be honest, um. But my, my suggestion is that uh, you know where they're at. So provide um, provide that scaffolding for every player. So if you are doing a skills game, right? So let's just take, for an example, a, a, a game where you are, let's just say we have a 10 by 10 square and 10 kids in it, soloing around inside the square, sort of avoiding each other, but non-competitive. If you know, uh, if that's your skill, Okay, and let's just say that the majority are around about the middle. Okay, and if you know that they're there, uh, that you start off at that point. So the kids who can do that are going to get bored very, very quickly. So you have a progression in your head, a, a differentiation, whatever you want to call it. You have a progression to that skill or that game that they have uh, to move them along. Okay, so for example, Column is flying it there. Okay, Column, will you try it with your uh, try it with your left foot? Okay, uh, now. Colin can go off and go with his left foot. Well, may as I'm at the back of the group, I'm, I'm the, the lesser skilled player and I'm still struggling to do it with my right foot or, or my strong foot. So someone told so me before uh, and it's some of the, 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 the best advice I've ever get, gotten. When you are asking kids to progress on with that skill, if you want or if you fancy it or if you're able, try it with your other foot. The kids who are not confident to do it won't do it, so let them off, and you know that like, you'll be able to see that. And the kids who are confident to do it will try it. So now all of a sudden you have three or four people trying it with their weak foot and developing because you know they can do it already on their, on their strong foot. 
you have the kid who's not ready there. Remember, we talked about that, that zone of proximal development. That's a little bit too far to reach for, for now. But all of a sudden, you're giving them the option to progress if they want. So if you want, have a go if you want. Okay, but you're not putting pressure. You're not stopping the session and telling everyone to do it. Okay, and what I would always try then to do is those who did try it with their weak foot that I would make sure I would try and give maybe a, a little bit of extra praise or single out someone who's tried it for the first time. Oh my God, Colin, that's fantastic. You, you, you uh, soloed with your, your weak foot and then all of a sudden that sort of, um, that, that reward, will, you'll see other kids um, want to try it and, and want that sort of, that, that positive feedback. So it, it, look, it's really tough. Um, I hope that that gives you a couple of, uh, of uh, things that you can try with your own kids and your own sessions. Um, I know if you're doing any online sessions at the moment, it's particularly useful because if, if all the kids can't see each other, you could set different challenges for different kids, you know, so uh, potentially a, a, a loophole there for, for the current environment. Excellent, you're, uh, you're after taking on two of the most regular and I suppose toughest questions that we get as coaches. Next one from Tom Farley. How, having visited so many schools, what are the factors that make some schools more active than others? Okay, that's part one. And then how is the move well, uh, move off the program affecting physical literacy or is it too early to tell? I think you said a 25% increase in that. And lastly, is there a rural urban divide? So the first yeah. one. Okay, so uh, what makes skills more active than others? Um, I don't know the actual answer. I don't have a definitive answer for you that. In my experience, uh, it tends to be the active schools, it, it tends to be really, really driven from the top. Okay, it re tends to be really, uh, the, the, the principals either drive it themselves or they empower the teachers to drive it and support it. Um, that's what I've seen. Uh, that's purely anecdotal. I can't say that. Um, for for everyone, but that's for me. That's it seems to come from the top. Um, the move well, move off, and just to, to clarify there. Um, so my project is called Moving Well, Being Well, but the move well, move off, and it, it, they came out with very similar at the, um, at similar timings. Uh, unfortunately, the names are so closely aligned, but but very close in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Whereas these guys are move well, move off, and it's from the PDST PE section, and it's a, a fantastic resource. I'd encourage any of you to have a look. Um, it's freely available online. They're brilliant for putting stuff up on, on Twitter or, or on Facebook, etc. as well. Um, so they have a full range of physical literacy resources and a load of games concentrating on fundamental movement skills and how to develop physical literacy through that. So those guys go around uh, the country and they train up uh, a certain amount of teachers in the schools. I would love uh, for them to get the resources to train up every teacher in the country. Um, but unfortunately, they, 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 they probably won't be able, they, they're not able to do that in the current, uh, the current environment that they are at the minute, but they're fantastic. Um, how it, it is too early to tell if they're having, um, if, if the, the impact they're having on physical literacy. But I'll just re refer back to the other research in terms of that we know um, from Australian st studies that if those kids, who, that we increase the fundamental movement skills at an early age, that they're more active in the teenage years. So. Um, if you take my, our own stu study that we showed that um, we had a 25% increase over a, an eight week period um, and that's just an hour a week, okay, two half hour sessions. So um, it, 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 it is doable, it's definitely uh, achievable um, and it, it's fantastic to see so many of you have given up your Wednesday evening to, to, to learn about this stuff because it is important and the word is getting out there and, and people are becoming more educated on it, but hopefully uh, we've a bit, a bit to go, but hopefully we can, we can do that. And or the last or part. Urban divide. Um, yeah, we didn't find a huge amount. We were really surprised. Us, um, I honest to God thought that the, the rural uh, kids were going to be um, a, an awful lot better than the urbans. And um, it is something that we're looking into a little bit deeper at the moment, seeing is there any other underlying factors that, that we can cross reference there. And, um, but I don't have any, um, definitive evidence on that yet so come back to me i'll come back in next year Colin, and i'll hopefully have results for you on that good book in right is it beneficial to try and build in fms skills into sessions for groups as they get older such as 12s and 14s yeah 100 percent. okay um so the, I, I know i've been talking about the younger kids an awful lot but there is uh stuff out there that's shown that improving the, the fms and kids at the 12 13 14 15 year old age group actually that does have a lasting impact. So uh, colleagues of mine in DCU, Dr. Sarah Jane Belton, Dr. Johan Isertel, and um, they have a, a, the, the Y-Path program. So that is um, 
youth uh, physical activity towards health. So basically, that is in a junior cycle, a junior cert, a junior cert sort of a, a resource for teachers, and it basically works on fundamental movement skills in a holistic manner. So driving that. Uh, it's a physical literacy basically resource that drives uh, confidence, motivation and all that true fundamental movement skills. So it's definitely really, really positive results from that. That's actually now available to every school in the country because of the sponsorship from the Irish Heart Foundation. Um, and again, brilliant, brilliant resources that you can access on, on, online. So I, w- I would encourage anyone at that age group to have a look for it. Now, what I would say is you may get a little bit more resistance from kids to doing this sort of stuff at that age group. Uh, they might think, oh, this game's a bit stupid or a bit silly. But if you find the right activity, there's millions and millions and millions of activities online uh, with, with FMS, with, with game-based stuff. You will find something that fits the group that you work with uh, and, and trying to integrate that into your sessions in your warm-ups, etc., will be really, really beneficial. And then if you think... On the other side of that, if you think that they do have a really good base of fundamental movement skills, you can look then at more sort of functional movements. So uh, that squash or that lunge or all these athletic movements that will transfer onto the pitch, but will also um, allow them then if they, as they get older, if they are going on to, let's say, that more elite level and, and, and engaging in resistance training or, or in that gym sort of work, that it would allow them to have the basic movements to, to load up on resistance, etc. So again, it's all about preparing them for down the line. Uh, uh, while you're improving them for now as well, but that delayed gratification to see them progress down the line in both their health, but also um, their sport. Last one, what do you do when coaching a player who comes from a non-sporting background and whose parents may not be over enthusiastic? Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, firstly, with the parents, I would try and engage them as best you can. Okay, try and engage them. Say, look, this is why we're doing this. This is why it's so important, and this is what we're hoping to achieve. Okay. By the way, you could help uh, by practicing this at home with them. Okay. Put the onus on the parent right from the off. Okay. This is what we want to do. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to achieve. Communicate that. Um, your son, your daughter is um, a little bit behind, or maybe isn't. Uh, it, isn't um, isn't progressing as uh, well as we would hope, let's say, in the kick. So here's some things you could try with him at home to help him, and, and that will improve his confidence and motivation to get better and, and, and hopefully keep him involved in the sport. In terms of the kid themselves, it comes back to the scaffolding. Find the level, think of the Mario, or Mario, or Nintendo analogy, find the level that they're comfortable at. Figure out where are they at, get them on that level, and then how do we progress on from there? How do we give them that little challenge to step up? And then once they get there, great, how do we step them up again? And, and that does step by step by step, and all of a sudden, I, I've found in previous experience that you will find huge engagement. You'll have to be patient, but just, just bear with it and, and keep pushing, and, and I've found a great engagement from, from that, using that approach. Excellent. Stephen? Thanks very much. You've been uh, you've been very good with your time as always. And I suppose you've been very helpful to us, Stone and Cork, but, uh, I said last four years now between workshops and conferences, and the feedback has always been hugely positive. And I'm sure it'll be the same tonight. Um, so there were some really interesting concepts or thoughts, and and I suppose you highlighted a few things that we that I suppose the, the part a lot of coaches wouldn't be aware of. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, Anything last things to add? Can where can people find you if they want to ask you questions? Twitter at uh, yeah at Behan underscore s uh, or email me Stephen at dcu Happy to help anyone if I can. And um, Colin, what I'll do is I, I can um, send you on um, some uh, some of those resources that we mentioned, uh, and people can can access them. Excellent. Um, so thanks very much, Stephen. So next week we'll actually be joined by one of your work or. I suppose your doctorate colleague, Cameron Pierce, is coming on with us and he'll be talking a bit about, I suppose, more on the confidence and motivation side of things, I think, Stephen, is what he's... he's yeah, so Cameron's a, psych- Cameron's a psychologist. Um, now, he's English, so go easy on him. <laughs> but uh, no, he's a, he's a great guy and a fascinating insight in terms of, of how you develop that confidence and motivation and how you can have such a lasting impact without ever... Um, without ever uh, kicking a ball or, or, or even just by the language that you're using. So, um, yeah, no, he's really, he's, 
it's top notch. Uh, uh, I'd say you'll enjoy it. If 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 uh, whetted your appetite on anything on that side, you'll enjoy it next week. Good. Well, you have to put no pressure on him there now. So um, <laughs> so well done. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thanks very much, everybody, and we'll see you all soon. Okay. No problem. Thanks for having me.